Once upon a time, there were day camp staff that worked the full season, full days, and missing time was a rare occurrence. Today, not so much. With the frontline staff reckoning of the past few years, getting our staff to just show up every day has become more and more of a chore. Today, we explore some proactive initiatives being taken by two of the most creative minds in our field, Ross Coleman and Adam Wallach. This is the Day Camp Pod. Welcome back to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And we are joined today by Adam Wallach from Mohawk Day Camp in Westchester, New York, and Ross Coleman, and we call it Merrick, Long Island, right? Um, on the South Shore. And uh, Ross tells me that we were actually scheduled to record one right when the world came to a screeching halt. So this is a long-awaited appearance of my friend Ross. So good to see you. Happy to be here. So, um, so we're, the reason that we came up with this uh, topic for today is actually because of the session that you guys uh, uh, came to at Tri-State, the roundtable thing, where we started talking about various staff things, and you guys had some unbelievably awesome ideas of things that you had either put in or are putting in to your programs. So we we're going to touch on those. Uh, today to share with the people from around the world. And as I was telling these guys before we got on, uh, we actually missed our 100th episode, like anniversary, like celebrate ourselves. So just so you know, even though this is like episode 101 or 102, and even though it says it's episode 77, we did a whole bunch of mini pods, but this is more than 100 times that we have gotten on here and shared wisdom with people in so many countries across the world, but more so in North America. So anyway, Russ, I was going to start with you a little bit. Um, and I also because I just want to let people know who you are. Give us a little like camp origin story and how you got to what you're doing right now. And then I'm going to chime in about a few other things to touch base too. So take it, Russ. Sure. Uh, my name is Ross Coleman, uh, owner director of Coleman Country Day Camp. We are uh, a day camp South Shore, as you mentioned, of Long Island. Uh, fortunate enough to be second generation camp family. My folks uh, Marla and George Coleman founded Coleman Country Day Camp in 1982. Uh, I was a camper in our first summer of 1983, uh, have worked through the ranks, uh, and uh, here I am today actively running uh, our camp. My folks are uh, are still around in the summer times and, and very much involved, um, but uh, my camp journey is a fortunate one in that I had, a, you know, had a nice start uh, in the business and certainly uh, consider myself very lucky to, to have had that beginning. Yeah, and from what I observe, pretty um, pretty eager to also make changes when they come too, and uh, and and shake things up, which I, I give you a lot of credit for. So so one of the cool things that Ross uh, does at his camp, which I just wanted to touch on, is the uh, off season business stuff that you got into. Can you give us a little um, synopsis of that and genesis of how it started? Because I think it's really amazing. Sure, it's it's actually a pretty uh, interesting story in that this was not part of our plan. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Mark Honigfeld, who uh, people listening to this pod, I'm sure know, who, who runs Trails End, he was looking for space for his daughter uh, to play winter soccer. And it's at, a pre it's at a premium here in Long Island. It's tough to find space. And he had come by to just check out our camp, as we all often do. We like to see each other's camps. And he, he saw one of our buildings, which was a, a field house set up for basketball and said, you ever think about uh, doing soccer here? I'm looking for space for my daughter for soccer. So I um, thought about it a little bit and ended up putting in a small investment for that winter to uh, put some turf down in an existing building, rented a, a heater for the season uh, for a few thousand dollars and basically had a handful of teams playing on that particular winter. This is going back close to 15 years ago. Uh, by being open that winter, we had other uh, teams, leagues able to come by and see it. And I was able to book the complete uh, the complete season for the following winter a year in advance. So we ended up having basically from about four in the afternoon until about 10 o'clock at night, Monday through Fridays booked in this one building uh, and on the weekends all day all night. Uh, to the point where the next year uh, I looked at putting a bubble over one of our existing turf fields and before doing so I lined up two years worth of uh, groups that wanted to rent the space. So we had it already paid for effectively before we built it. So now we had two facilities uh, one being about uh, about 18,000 square feet, the other one being about 25,000 uh, square feet. We did that for a number of years. They were all sold out. 
and then went ahead and built our third one that we call our dome, uh, which is about 45,000 square feet. Uh, and again, same, same model. We had it sold uh, for a couple of years out before building it. So we now operate three facilities. They will actually go up. Uh, the two bubbles will start going up tomorrow. It takes about four days from zero to completely built buildings. Uh, it's about four days. It actually inflates in about five minutes uh, to, to 15 minutes, but the actual process is about four days. So we will be busy um, from November 1st through, a, through April 1st as a indoor facility. And then we use the fields also as outdoor facilities the remainder of the year. So it's, it's a nice synergy to our camp program. That's awesome. So we're going to have uh, links. Ross gave us a link to his, uh, to this. It's like the side business kind of thing. Uh, it's got its own website and um, it'll be in the show notes. Um, so, 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 but you should check it out. You got to see what this looks like. So basically um, Ross is like main field that he had in the middle of his camp. He astroturfed it. Now you did that before you were doing this business. You turfed that before. So if you were starting from scratch, certainly uh, you can build a field. In an ideal world, you have a field and building you do as part of one plan. We already had one field that was existing. So that one, we ended up bubbling around the field. We actually have to pull back the turf each year in order to, um, to put our bubble up and then re, you know, reattach it when we take it down. But it's, it's a nothing thing. It's a few hours. Uh, our big one, we were going to redo our turf anyway. So we put the building up first and then turfed it. Once the building was up, it, it lets you be more accurate. Uh, wow. In an ideal world, you would do it that way. Wow. And, and just out of curiosity, what, what do you think ballpark, the percentage of your revenue is now with that stuff versus the regular day camp? It's become more than a side business. I, I will say yeah. that. It, no, I a, know it's, it's substantial. It, it, it's a substantial uh, percentage wise. I would have to, uh, uh, it's 10%. Uh, really? it's, it's not, it's not nothing. No. No, no, it's serious. Uh, well, and by the way, 10% when you're talking about Long Island, a large Long Island day camp, a significant amount. So I get it. Um, by the way, Adam Wallach, feel free to chime in. Okay. Even when we're talking to Ross and we're talking about this stuff here too. Have you ever done any, any kind of stuff like that, Adam, on your facility? So do you do anything besides your school? I know you do a, a serious school there. Do you do any kind of rentals of your facilities at all? We don't. We, we do uh, very small rentals, uh, similar to, as Ross said, like my son's soccer team and a few other teams jump in. But we, we have visited uh, uh, Coleman and uh, we are in the in the early stages of looking to um, add uh, some turf and bubbles here at Mohawk. And I was just sharing with uh, Ross before the call that we also are exploring building a curling center here at the camp. So uh, there's a local club and um, benefit of this curling center compared to the bubble, which also has a significant benefit, but the curling center is, is a true building. And what I've learned so far about curling is, you know, it's just a concrete floor with coolers, you know, underneath like an ice rink that they just, you know, float the water and then it yeah. becomes ice. So um, when these buildings are not in use um, during the during the summer months, you know, we would have a, a real building to use during the summer, which has significant benefits. So uh, we're hoping to uh, learn from Ross and uh, maybe add some uh, of these programs as well. No, it's really and, interesting. Andy, I will say as a as a side business, it's a great one because of the fact when is your facility quieter? Uh, that's the winter time and the businesses that are traditional indoor sports facilities, their hardest time is the summertime because nobody wants to be inside uh, and the overhead is quite low. So when you ask about a percentage, uh, that's a percentage if, you, if you're going off a of gross, uh, but your, your margins are a lot better. Oh yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I know that with my picnic business. Absolutely. It's funny, uh, Adam, about the curling center. I had this conversation with Steve Baskin about five years ago about him potentially building that at his place in Texas, because you think about it, like they need regional training places. You know, they're at a loss of where it is. It's getting ice time. You know, like uh, I have campers that are figure skaters and they're waking up at four in the morning to practice their figure skate. It's not like there's ice time for curling out there, you know? So let's hear some camps creating curling centers. <laughs> around here that would be really damn fascinating all right so so ross uh back to you why don't you tell us about you uh, what you did with your attendance stuff uh last year it's very interesting and an sure. interesting model i think we were all going through uh similar struggles in 2021 uh and that was that was probably the hardest of the staffing years i, I felt that last year was uh while not you know back to 2018 2019 as far as ease of staffing the, the camp certainly better than 2021 but one of the things we knew in 2021 
was that our bench was short. Uh, we were not going to have a lot of people um, to fill in two roles for, for multiple reasons. One, just the amount of bodies, we didn't have as many. Uh, and two, you really weren't looking to have people working in different groups in 2021. You wanted to try to keep it as steady as you can for, uh, for world events. So we tried to figure out a way to keep the staff that we had here. Uh, and what we did was we ended up doing a weekly raffle where if you did not miss a second of time as a counselor, meaning you did not come in late, you did not leave during the day for a doctor, you did not miss a day, whatever it may be, you had to be here 100% of the time you would for that week, you would be entered into a raffle. We'd take all the names, uh, whatever was left, a couple of hundred people or so, put them into a raffle. And then each Monday morning, we would draw two names out. Uh, we would do it in front of the entire camp. When I would announce it on the PA, uh, we did not announce what we were doing exactly, but basically what we were doing, we were giving out two $500 uh, awards for people who had the perfect attendance. So if you were in the raffle, we would get on the microphone and say, you know, today's winner, uh, we have two winners we'd like to announce of our staff raffle. We just called it our staff raffle. We didn't give any more information on the PA, but the staff all knew about it through orientation. And on the spot, they would each receive $500. Uh, this created much more excitement than if you were doing a $100 uh, perfect attendance for the summer, which I, I know some places do, or whatever it may be. And it was also instant gratification. So, all right, so hold you, on, hold on. Let's start with it. I'll go back to the instant gratification part. Okay, so <clears throat> so over the PA system, it says that Andy Pritikin and Adam Wallach just won the, the staff raffle, right? Now, what happens at that point? You say we immediately get this money. Yep. So does like does like a preschool kid come <laughs> running out of the office with like a lot of dollars in his hand? Like what happens? So what we do is, well, first of all, anybody around them is going crazy. The counselors, <laughs> uh, the campers, the campers don't know why they're going crazy, but they're going crazy. And, and this is true of anybody who is an assistant counselor or a counselor. So effectively 16 year olds, all the way up to your moms and dads, we, uh, we do not have in our leadership, uh, but we have in all of our assistant counselors and counselors. So the, the winners come running up to the office, uh, all excited. We have two envelopes ready. I typically suggest to them, they leave it in the office and pick it up at the end of the day. <laughs> so they're not walking around with it for the day. Uh, and they come back right before heading home. Uh, but everybody's congratulating them all day. Uh, we've had counselors when they win, they take out all of their fellow counselors for dinner. Uh, it's, it's just been a great thing for camaraderie. And if you miss a day on Tuesday and you're out this week, you're right back in it next week. Whereas right. if, you do a, if you do a full summer perfect attendance, and if you miss a day on day two, what's keeping you here uh, after that? So that, that's a big change. And I thought about it, but I decided that even if you win in week one, if you're here all of week two, you're right back in it. We actually had one person win twice this summer. Which is pretty interesting because you have a lot of staff. We do. Right? That, that's great odds. Um, so, you know, if you listen to the, the podcast that came out recently with me and Jonathan Gold, I was saying how we had done, I thought I was being innovative by doing four week chunks as opposed to eight weeks. And um, but we had a, an extra special raffle on the last day for anyone who was perfect the whole summer. And this year it was it, I think it was less than 30 names in a hat out of, uh, you know, over 250, 300 staff. So so people definitely give less of a crap once they've missed a day, you know, because then they know they're out of it. So so I appreciate that. Thank you. I just also want to clarify on this. Um, so when you say counselors, what does that mean? You say it goes up to counselor level, like what age? Are people eligible for this? This college students, basically, and high school students? Not CITs. Once you're a paid employee, mm -hmm. so effectively entering 11th grade is the youngest that you can be eligible. So if uh, we actually had a person who won twice this year was probably 17 years old. So they, they had an extra thousand dollars that they took home this year uh, as part of the raffle. And, and it worked out well in that we pretty much just odds wise, just about every division had winners uh, throughout the course of the summer. And again, the excitement level was, sure. was, was top. And, and what about like the basketball specialist or someone like that, or a lifeguard or someone like that? Everybody was in it with the exception of our supervisory team. Right. So uh, up to so, management level. Correct. I got it. All right. That's excellent. And, and look, Ross is doing $500 a crack. He's got a lot of kids. He charges a lot at his camp. Doesn't have to be that much. It could be half that and your staff would be pretty psyched, you know? And, you know, while it may seem like a lot of money to some camps, um, think about the money that you spend on staff stuff, right? On tchotchkes, right? If you decided to give your, your staff all a shirt, 
you know, that would be, that would add up to a ton of money. If you decided to do incentive bonuses, all these different things. Um, so I think it's money well spent. I think it's a really awesome idea. Yeah, Andy, if I could even share yeah. um, in, in, as Ross indicated in 2021, which was a bit painful for many of us, mm. we, um, you know, we got to a point in 2021 where we we're just literally just throwing money at people just to, <laughs> you know, have, have, a, have them show up. But what Ross said, which, you know, I, I, we, you know, I was unsure about, but we did that we did something called Wheel of Wow Wednesday. So on Wednesdays, I'd literally go around with, with an iPad, with an app on it, with like, you know, a wheel and, you know, they could hit the button to spin the wheel on the app and it would have, um, it would have, um, and I, I would go up to a counselor with the campers there. And there was a lot of excitement with the campers being there, even though we were giving away money. And I'd say to the camper, like, you know, uh, you, you've been selected, which is like somewhat random. And I tell them you could take 20 bucks right now, or you could spin the wheel. So if they spun the wheel, it could be a dollar, it could be $5, it could be $7, or it could be $100, or they could just take $20. And it just like, you know, cause a lot of excitement because the kids all, all you know wanted the council to spin the wheel so no one took the twenty dollars and then some people won a hundred and then there was a lot of excitement and, and 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 buzz around camp so i do think there is something with these incentives when it is done in front of the kids that you know causes more buzz and excitement throughout the camp absolutely our senior division uh for the last bunch of years which is middle school kids has been doing a wheel of prize kind of things like that that they do during their morning uh, arrival uh, assembly with the kids and they go nuts for it so yeah that's a that's a home run no doubt about it and they sell those wheels online you don't have to make one right they're out there <laughs> sam were you going to say something before i was just going to say being a, a public um <clears throat> government agency i don't get to hand out cash so i am probably spending the same buying third year jackets and tie-dye shirts for people who did something good and and that kind of stuff. But um, unfortunately, I have to put it in something that I can voucher and <laughs> have. So what so you're saying munis municipal municipal organization are not allowed to bribe? Is that what we're saying? Exactly. Like, like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Consider on down upon. Yes. All right. Um, well, but um, I like your ideas of presentation. And I really like the idea that every week's a new week and they get to keep having chances because like you said, why else would they continue to try to make it work we, we saw significant we saw a significant drop in people running out for an hour for a doctor those doctor appointments started uh being scheduled for after camp at five o'clock we had people asking us before they scheduled things if it impacted their being in the raffle and if when it did they didn't miss it, it made a significant difference and i think it changed the way we staffed in 22 uh, based on an expectation of of having people in camp it, it made a real change I have a big problem, uh, like twice a year, there's two big concert festivals here and everybody wants off. Do you guys have any good ideas for those, like it's country thunder, you know, how do you work it out so that everyone doesn't want off that Friday so they can go? Well, I mean, at, at my camp, there the statement is there are no off days and they just know that up front so if they were going to go to this country music festival they would have to either ask permission and we'd say no or they'd have to lie and potentially risk getting caught in that lie but i think that conjoining that with some kind of incentive thing like ross spoke about i think then you know they're going to weigh it a little bit more uh, we have a similar one in down in wilmington delaware that our staff likes to go to. Um, before we go on, though, I do have to give a shout out to our sponsors. Yes, we have to keep the uh, we have to keep the the truck moving on this thing here. You know, um, uh, these CRS Commercial Recreation Specialists. If it wasn't for them and their support, um, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have a podcast basically because we wouldn't be able to pay anybody to edit our stuff up. So they they are CRS Commercial Recreation Specialists, the fine purveyors of the best recreation solutions to keep camp going strong. Check out their website, crs4rec.com. And what I want to just talk about for a few seconds is their alert system that I have. They call it an emergency alert system. Um, so, so basically, you know, Ross talked about the PA system that he can call, you know, Johnny down to win his money or whatever. We don't have a PA system at our facility and a lot of camps don't. And um, honestly, looking into these PA systems there, if you have a big facility and you want to put one in, it is a serious, serious investment these days to do that. Um, 
so we invested in an alert system through them that basically uh, from my office, I have three different alert sounds. And one is for a lost camper drill. One is for a scatter drill. Uh, and I don't even use the third one, which theoretically I could just have everybody come back and say it's safe. Um, but it works. It's worked out great. Um, and and we, it has four horns, each facing in different directions. And um, and it has done an awesome job. So anyway, it's very affordable. Talk to Rich Wills, my man, commercial recreation specialist, crs for recom CRS is serious about fun. All right. Back to the show. <laughs> All right, before we uh before we go on with, with Adam's story, I, I I Adam did his bio on, on the last uh time he was on, which was a few years ago, pre-COVID, right? We, of the transportation episode. Uh, but I've known Adam for a while from Harbor Hills to uh out in Rochester, right? And then to Kiwi, and now he has taken over like one of the biggest, most prolific camps in the country, Mohawk Day Camp, and he's done an awesome job with it. Um, and I just want to formally, on this Day Camp podcast episode, uh, Adam, I want to thank you for the sake of Liberty Lake and for a lot of the other camps for you sharing the um, the booklet you put together in 2020, in spring of 2020, um, the preparation for camp booklet, your operations guide. It really was phenomenal and i know you have an interesting story of how you sort of got put it all together so if you could share that because that was really really wonderful sure so yeah the summer of 2020 um is one we'll never forget so um you know leading up to to that summer and nobody knew anything whether camps were going to open or not um i think it, it was uh it was memorial day weekend that uh myself and my graphic designer dug in and i think we put a uh, 25 or 30 hours in that weekend. And at that point, many other states, um, you know, rolled out their COVID guidelines and, you know, the number of families calling to, to cancel camp was, was a bit overwhelming. So, um, you know, we, we pulled together the data from all these other states, some, some stuff that other people, you know, put together on COVID. And we basically went live to our families and said, you know, we're ready for camp to open. Here's what camp's going to look like. We had some great visuals and the pool and transportation um, and bunks and, you know, really fortunate here at Mohawk with, um, you know, 45 acres and lots of um, open air program buildings that we were able to provide families with a really nice picture of what camp would look like in a pandemic. And um, uh, it was probably about a, a, a three or four weeks later, we got permission from the governor that camps are going to open. And we had a really successful 2020 camp season. Um, you know, we ran an 800 camper, eight with 800 campers that summer with, with transportation, uh, zero COVID um, cases. And we had a great summer and really set us up for success um, moving forward with 2021 and, and summer 2022, where we're fortunate to already be sold out um, for, for next summer and have been full for about a month now. I'm muted. So, so Adam is known by his peers as being a pretty savvy marketing guy, that is for sure. But this piece that he put together, this uh, operations guide, I mean, Adam, you even said it to myself, might be the best marketing piece you ever made. I mean, we were all at a place mentally where we knew we could do it and we wanted to do it. But Adam put together a thing that that was it was this thing that parents could hold and actually give them a sense of um, I guess these guys know what they're talking about when we were at a state that we really sort of didn't know what we were talking about. Like we thought we did, but we were unsure and all that kind of thing. And it just created something, you know, concrete. You know, yeah. so it was great. And in yeah. a real, real layman's terms, I mean, think that's one of the genius things of marketing, right, is to be able to create something that people could just take. And even if they're layman, they don't know anything about it and understand it. Yeah. And Randy, we, uh, Andy, we were, um, you know, we were really proud of, of that, of that, of that operating guide. And I forget the exact name we called it. So, you know, we did put it out in, in the camp world for people to see. And uh, we put it out on, on Flipbook. So we were able to track it. And um, I, I haven't, I probably haven't looked in a year and a half or so, but at one point we were over 50,000 views in, in 17 different countries for the statistics <laughs> on it. So it's um, hopefully it was a resource that, that helped people. Yeah. Can we get the, the link in the show notes? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I probably shared my Liberty Lake one with 
thousand people <laughs> and and i put in my first page i gave you the shout out to it because you. Like you and and charles you know our friend charles was very helpful with that um all right so adam tell us about being a mohawk professional sure so um so so this year um you know as we rolled out our um incentive for for, for, for staff, um, our salaries increased substantially this year as well at, at Mohawk. So as our salaries were increasing, what we did was we, we pulled out $400 of the increase and we turned that into what we called the Mohawk professional bonus. So um, similar to, to Ross where, you know, we didn't put everything in um, up front, we, we made it $50 a week. So for what we call being a Mohawk professional, this is something that we talked about um, during training. What being a Mohawk professional means is showing up for camp um, every day. It means not using your cell phone during the day. It means coming prepared, your sneakers on, your staff shirt, you have a bathing suit, your name is written on, on your staff shirt. Um, you're in the pool um, with, with your campers during swim and you're actively participating with your group um, throughout the camp day. So doing those five things, you know, is what a Mohawk professional would do. And if you do that, you earn $50 a week. Um, so that's your $400 additional bonus. So for most people, you know, $400 is significant. It's certainly on, on the camp salary, that's a significant um, percentage. So we found that to be a successful uh, path for us this summer for engaging staff. We also found it to be a tool where you know each direct supervisor had control over this fifty dollars. We managed it by exception, so like everybody's getting it until we're told that they're not getting it. And you know, essentially, if someone doesn't receive their 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 Mohawk professional bonus at the end of the week and they weren't absent, that's a conversation. So either a progressive coaching forms getting filled out, there's a conversation. If you're not receiving it two weeks in a row and it wasn't because you're absent, then that person probably shouldn't work at camp anymore. So it was really a great tool besides the incentive for the counselors, it, it was really a good management tool for us as well. And you did this from front lines starting, whatever youngest people you take professionally, right? up until what level? So it was our, our positions that we call our, our general counselors. So everybody's a, a general counselor, a lead counselor, who are those people who are like better than a general counselor, but not quite ready to be a group leader and assistance specialist. Those, those team members who are working, you know, at Art Studio, at Ninja Warrior, at Outdoor Adventure, but they're not the head specialists. So it, it was, you know, Basically, everybody 22 and, and, and younger had an opportunity to. Right. So this. it's similar to Ross's model in, in a exactly. way with, with that, like disqualifying people, right, who are making a lot of money anyway to start with. It's very interesting. Um, I, I love it. I like that you yeah. defined what you were looking for and that you could use it as a coaching tool every week um, and not only hurt them money wise if they weren't meeting it, um, it could be their job. So. Um, that's a good way to use it. Yeah. And, and the way we explained it, you know, I, I think in like our, not camp culture, but it's in the world, you know, bonuses have like a meaning behind it where, you know, does my boss and my supervisor really want to give me this money or would they rather not give us the, the money? So as we talked about this at training, we were really clear with everybody, like, we want to give you this $400. If we're giving this $400 to everybody, that means camp's going amazing. You're doing a great job. The kids are happy. The families are happy. So we really tried to, you know, make it very clear to people, like, it's, 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 it's my pleasure to give you this additional $50 a week and not something that you have to work so hard for. But like, you know, it's very clear. It's these five things. It's really the bare minimum for being a counselor is what these five things Right, are. right, right. All right, I got some questions and thoughts. But before we do that, I have to give a shout out to Camptivities because scheduling was a headache. We all know that, right? So you should check out Camptivities specifically designed for camps by camp people, including our friends at Camp Kinneret, all right, out there in Los Angeles. So take time, money, and resources and create your best diverse activity schedule. And you can find more about it at Camptivities dot com right they got auto scheduling camper and group scheduling rainy day scheduling which is pretty neat manual adjustments tons of customizable settings so much more if you're looking for a better way to schedule this summer go to camptivities.com set up a time to chat they'd love to show you the next big thing in camp all right don't wait till next year 
Start the onboarding process now, camptivities.com and tell them you heard it from us. All right. So yeah, the professionalism thing. And, and Ross, I think you'd agree too, right? Like that's what we're talking about here. You know, I mean, Adam said it himself. <laughs> we're paying people extra to do the bare minimum. <laughs> He literally said that, right? I mean, it's messed up, but it's sort of true, right? We we have to sort of reframe people's brains into what job commitment and work ethic and professionalism is, right? And and I like the way that Adam worked that into his actual orientations. I think that's what needs to happen, right? So the whole experience gets framed as such. And I think I have to do something like that as well. I saw what Adam did. I really, I liked, uh, he sent the link on and he actually made a nice, uh, graphic as far as what it means to be the Mohawk professional. It's easy to follow. I think we have to give our staff clear expectations and lay them out and then hold them accountable to meet those expectations and to have something more than just words, to have something in writing or or a video. We actually have our staff sign off on five non-negotiables that we have for them to work at our camp. And we do it each uh, staff orientation. We have five things. Uh, you know, if you have 20 things, it's tough to really keep track. Our list is short. Things such as cell phone usage. Uh, we, you know, we don't have our cell phone. Uh, our cell phone is not to be seen in a camp setting. Uh, that is a non-negotiable. Whether you've been here as a 16-year-old for a minute or of a supervisor of 40 years, you can't be here if your cell phone is out. It's a non-negotiable. Yeah. Uh, language is a, is a non-negotiable. Uh, and we have our five things, but we have our staff sign off on those five things. Uh, and I think it goes along with what Adam is doing, which is you need to establish the set of rules, guidelines, agreements, whatever you want to call it, that we're all going to work together. Uh, and our staff is a young staff, you know, in camp, in camps in general. And they, each year, they grow up uh, more and more having been born with a cell phone in their hand. So we yeah. have to establish what is this bubble that we have here. Uh, they want to buy in. Uh, and it's all about your culture. If you have a culture and you have a large returning staff, the new people that come in quickly learn uh, not only what's accepted, but but what you know what's celebrated here. You know, it, it's celebrated here to be silly, to be spirited. Uh, you don't, you're not the coolest in the room by, you know, by by trying to be cool. You're the coolest by being involved and being active. And, and I think that's all. It all ties together with the tenants, right? You know, the other. It's not just about money to keep people here. It's about quality of experience. The staff want to be at camp because they're having fun. If they're having a good time, you're doing things to create fun for the staff, they don't want to miss. If, if they wanted to miss, they'd work a different job that makes more money, but that's not why they're here. They're here to be part of camp. Prolific, true. And, and you know, the big part of what you just said all there to me is keeping them, holding them accountable, right? Which both you and Adam said. Uh, that, that is such an important thing. And I think that's a thing that lacks a lot in day camp administration because we put middle managers in there who are school teachers or whatever, and it's their summer job, right? And they want to they want to create a sort of path of least resistance for themselves, right? They, they don't want to have hard conversations a lot with people. They don't want to be taking money out of their pockets, right? Like they would be doing at Mohawk. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, they take, they take the path, at least just, they, they take the passive aggressive approach and they don't do anything or say anything about it. And it's holding them accountable. And, and like you said, Ross, about like the cell phones, like it's a non-negotiable. All right. So then you have to fire people. Right. And, and if you're walking into a place that has a history of proving that, then it's ingrained. But for most camps that don't have that history, you have to create that. And that leads me to, I just have to ask this question, Ross. So when I got into camping and I was like in my mid twenties, early thirties, there was there was a, a sort of historical story about George Coleman that he used to fire somebody at orientation every single year. Was this true? <laughs> First off, I, I think we'll all agree, Dif different times, right? Of different course, times. it's okay. He, he, I think he would be very quick to find somebody who, who might be talking uh, that he could right. make an example of during orientation while he was speaking, whether they uh, were fired or not. I, I think I remember it happening once. I don't think it was an annual tradition. Uh, I will say on the cell phone piece, though, you do sometimes have to have, have to let somebody go uh, for that. And by doing so, you will stop your cell phone problem. If, if it's constantly warnings, it doesn't really do any good. Uh, they, there's like an imaginary scorecard. I forget which, uh, which one of our great camp people uh, did this at Tri-State, but I loved it. And I, I hate that I'm not giving credit. 
they said that we all have imaginary scorecards or each ca each camp or each counselor has an imaginary scorecard they walk around with and they watch how me as camp director or you as counselor handles the situation if johnny's throwing a rock and, and i say hey johnny stop throwing a rock and i walk away and don't really do anything about it then johnny throws a rock two more times and on the third time johnny throws the rock i, I actually go handle the situation they take out their scorecard and put ross down as a three so you get two freebies at Ross because on the third one, that's when he'll actually do something. So my number is a three. So we talk about, you know, trying not to be, uh, don't be threes and fours and fives here. If we want to have a desired outcome, you know, we have to have expectation and, you know, you have to be able to hold them accountable quickly. Yeah, very true. All right, guys, that was wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing your stuff and as much stuff that you're willing to share on our show notes, you know, we'll take it and, and spread around because certainly I'm going to be hitting you up. Um, for those things, because I definitely, you know, usually there's one big thing for uh, orientation every year. Uh, last year, it was a lot of DEI kind of stuff. This year is definitely professionalism and, and and work ethic and that kind of thing. And just helping teach this because the kids, they're not coming in with it. You know, they don't really have a reference for it. And in this day and age, uh, their minds are very fickle. They get easily frustrated. You know, they have to feel safe and all that kind of thing. And, and we're going to be digging in on that and talking about how, you know, it is a tough job and it's going to make, pull you out on the other end a lot stronger. And a lot of that is adhering to, you know, the rules and 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 the professionalism that we need. Right. And, and what you guys were saying can be adapted to any camp situation. So, you know, just because I'm government doesn't mean I, I can't use those tools you were just talking about and come up with something appropriate for my camp. Yeah. And, and these guys run big camps, right? I mean, how many staff do you guys have, Ross? Total ballpark. Uh, over 500. Right. And and you too, Adam, right? Yeah, over I mean, 500. So, so you know, I know that there's, there's camps listening that have, you know, three dozen staff. These are all concepts that are important. And, and honestly, I like listening to what these big camps do and what they do at places like Six Flags and stuff. Because if you could make it work on that mass level, then that proves that it, that's effective, right? So again, thanks again uh, for, for hooking us up with this info. So I wanna thank the Go Camp Pro team, Camp Activities and Commercial Recreation Specialists for allowing us to bring this podcast to you. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Day Camp Pod or your, on your favorite podcast platform. Check out our show notes from this episode and others at daycamppodcast.com, as well as contact info on the show, our guests, and for me and Sam. Thanks for listening and making yourself a better Day Camp Pro. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of the Day Camp Pod.